Hello. Hi. How's everyone doing? All right. My name is Rahul, and I'm here to talk to you about how to run a successful ICO. But the way I'm going to do that is, first of all, I'll take you through a journey on my business. But let's just talk about that particular subject for a moment. How do you run a successful ICO? Step one, you go to ethereum.com and you create your token. It takes about 10 minutes. Step two, you download a picture of Bill Gates and you put him on your site and you tell everybody he's an advisor to your company. <laughs> Step three. Now, but seriously, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about how to create a successful ICO from somebody who's, who did it. Last year, we created a token and we sold uh, somewhere around 128 million, 130 million tokens, mostly to customers. Um, we, we collected around 112,000 Ethereum, um, and, uh, and it's been pretty good for us. But first, let me explain to you our business and the journey and how we decided to do this, and then we'll get into that. So my name is Rahul, and I am the founder of a company called Unicorn. Unicorn is an esports company. How many of you know what esports is? Great. If I asked that question a year or two ago, nobody would put their hand up, so that's a good sign. Um, <clears throat> I started this company in 2014. Unicorn is a company that is at the cutting edge of esports. Um, I used to be with Microsoft, where I started Microsoft Ventures, and prior to that, I was a gamer. My career was built on building gaming companies. I actually started the world's first PC gaming hardware manufacturer. It was called Voodoo PC. We built the best PCs in the world specifically to play video games on. People who are competitive gamers would play with those PCs today if that company was still there. We ended up selling that to HP. Then I joined Microsoft, started Microsoft Ventures, and I was there for a little over three years. <clears throat> and one of the things that was always calling me was getting back into gaming. I, I, I always wanted to get back to be an entrepreneur. And at Microsoft, we used to study trends. We studied lots of trends, and what we would do is we would help startups by investing in them, putting a little bit of capital, and then helping them build and grow their businesses. And a couple of the trends that I found interesting, well, first of all, my kids were heavy into video games, heavy into esports in particular. My son, who at that time was 15 years old, kept telling me to quit Microsoft, what am I doing at that company, go start another gaming company, you got to see how big esports e e e is getting. And for those of you who don't know, esports are heavy, heavily competitive video games that are played by professional players around the world. And these players make millions of dollars, and they fill stadiums, uh, you know, everywhere. And it's the fastest growing sport ever. Um, if you, if you, our fastest growing sport currently. If you look at other traditional sports, uh, you know, some of the trends that we looked at. For example, the PGA Tour. Uh, the average fan in the PGA Tour is about 70 years old. The average fan in Major League Baseball is about 54 years old. So essentially, every day, a PGA Tour fan and a Major League Baseball fan have heart attacks, and four eSports fans are born. Because kids play video games, and they've been playing video games for a very long time. And then the other trend that we spotted was l what's happening in Las Vegas. In particular, there's more people going to Las Vegas now than ever in the history of Las Vegas. There's like 45 million people who went to Vegas last year, and there's more people coming out this year. And Vegas is investing heavily in sports. The big challenge is they're losing revenue on the casino floor, specifically on the slot machines, which is a big revenue driver for them. They're trying their hardest, though. I'll tell you what. They're taking those old-ass slot machines, and they're replacing them with digital machines with Britney Spears on it and Pitbull because they figure young people are going to just run over to that machine instead of going to the nightclub. But there's still 150-year-olds that are using those machines. And so our approach is to create these experiences inside of casinos. We have a sports book. Um, Unicorn is basically a company that sits at the intersection of video games, gambling, or legal gambling, I should say, and sports. And what we do is we create, first and foremost, the most comprehensive sports book for esports in the world. Um, we do all the odds on all the major tournaments. We have an odds making machine that can predict odds on your chances of winning a particular video game. 
<clears throat> and we create content. So we're like sort of like ESPN. If you go to our website, we create unique content around esports, like written and video content. We have our own tournament platform. We run tournaments online, buy in tournaments. We also run tournaments at the MGM Grand every week. Um, and we even have team ownership. We own a big stake in one of the hottest CSGO teams in the world, who also happens to be the most popular uh, esports team in Germany. Now, that may not sound like a big deal, except one in every five Germans watch esports. So the space that we're in is an, is an incredible space. One of the biggest challenges, though, is the regulation. Now, we're dealing in a space that's a highly regulated industry. We are, by the book, we operate real money betting in markets where it's completely legal to do so. So we work with regulators. We have licenses in Australia, in the Isle of Man, and we just got a license in Malta, which covers 80% of Europe. <clears throat> And we also uh, started working with them on crypto, which I'll talk to you in a minute. But essentially, we're, we're taking bets at that time. In 2014, we raised $10 million. Um, and we started to take bets in a couple of different countries just so we could build out our sports book. But we had people in Korea, people in the US, people all over the world that wanted to use the dumb platform. And they couldn't. Because at that time, it was a dumb platform. All it was doing was taking bets from markets where we could legally take bets from, but we had no way of, of engaging and growing a fan base. So what did we do? Two things. The first thing is, we created a coin. This was in 2015. We created something called the Unicoin. And the purpose of the Unicoin was to allow gamers anywhere to earn the coin for free by connecting their Riot accounts, their Steam accounts, their gaming accounts to our platform, they could earn those tokens, and then they could play with it on our platform. They could play bet. These tokens are not transferable. They cannot be sold. They cannot be bought. Um, you can't do anything with these tokens other than use them on our platform. But it's incredible because what we thought we'd do is we'd build out this token ecosystem, and you know, we'd figure if customers liked it, you know, engage the platform, and we would look for new markets as to where the hottest betting action was. And oh my god, we, we turned over about 250 million unicorns in six months. And the platform went crazy. People were entering raffles, they were playing on the platform, they were betting for free. And in the meantime, we were running real money betting in the markets that we were licensed in. At that time, it was the UK and Australia. But we noticed where the hot markets are. We know the top 10 esports markets in the world for betting action, and we know where we need to get licensed. And at the same time, we had a huge challenge. The big challenge we had was dealing with banks. Um, we, 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 we had an issue where we wanted to expand across Europe. And as you know, and, and at least you may know, in my business, a heavy regulated betting business, dealing with banks is a nightmare. When you have multiple banks, multiple currencies, uh, you know, multiple bankers who come and go as they please, it's a very difficult process. So we emailed all of our investors. Um, we asked them, hey, we got a problem here. We either need relationships with banks quickly so we can grow this business, or we need help as to what the next step is for us. We raised $10 million with the likes of Ashton Kutcher, Mark Cuban, Sherry Redstone, um, Elizabeth Murdoch, like Rupert Murdoch's daughter, uh, and also Tabcorp. It's like the largest betting operator in Australia. And Mark Cuban reached out and told us to start looking at blockchain technology. This was two years ago. So believe it or not, Mark Cuban is actually a fan of crypto. Um, and, but back then, he said, you got to start looking at blockchain because I really think it'll help you deal with your commerce issue. So we started to look at it. We didn't know much about it, but we started to look at it from a regulated standpoint. Not from a how do we break the law standpoint, but how do we help regulators deal with things like AML, KYC, how do we deal with things like uh, you know, anti-sanctions bouncing? How do we deal with transaction history for betting customers, which by the way, in our business, is the most important thing, where customers have to be able to see every single transaction that they've ever placed and be able to know how much they're winning or losing. So it was like, wow, blockchain technology is the ultimate technology for this. If we apply our thinking on this, we could tie users to wallets, we could have complete KYC, complete individual verification, complete control over who's coming on our platform and knowing who they are and whether to bounce them or not. And that was sort of the thinking. And as you know, I don't need to explain to you how big the crypto market is, but I often do to a lot of people. And so here we are, Unicorn, at the time, you know, we're, we're sitting now as on the cutting edge of esports and crypto. 
the two most ridiculously growing industries in the world. However, we still hadn't come up with the token concept yet. We still had the unicoin, and we were generating users. We had users all over the world. So what did we do? Last year, we approached our users, and my biggest concern was making sure that our users understood crypto. Because a lot of you who want to do ICOs don't think about that. I'm serious. I've had over 200 companies approach me saying they want me to advise them. One of them was the most funniest thing I've ever heard of. And it was a retirement community uh, you know, with a token. And I'm like, holy shit, man. Have you tried using a wallet before? Like, you know, this is like a marketing guy. Do you know anything about crypto? How the hell do you expect an 80-year-old person to trade goddamn crypto or even to pick up your token? Like, how do you expect this to work? It's not going to work. And if all you're doing is creating a token to raise money for some project, that is not the approach that you should be taking for this. So we, we polled our customers and we said, hey guys, we got the Unicoin, we know you love it. Many of you are asking for more uses for the Unicoin. Have you used Bitcoin before? Do you know what Ethereum is? Do you know what a crypto wallet is? We asked very generic questions. We didn't directly say, what if we turned Unicoin into a crypto? And 70% of our customers responded. Unbelievably, most of them have played with Bitcoin. Many of them were interested in Bitcoin, which is huge. I mean, we're dealing in a very interesting millennial space where these customers really understand, you know, understand what's going on. So then we said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take Unicoin and we're gonna fork it. We created Unicoin Silver, which is our free token that continues to be free on the platform. And then we created Unicoin Gold. Unicoin Gold, sold to over 50% customers uh, last year. Like I said, we raised 112,000 Ethereum, and we actually have users on our platform using the token. We didn't raise, we didn't like go sell tokens to go build a project. We actually had a working project already. All we had to do was integrate Unicoins into it. And then we created the most robust token selling platform, at least at that time, on Earth, which basically handles all the things like KYC, AML, it handles um, anti-sanctions bouncing, which you have to do. It handles things like individual verification, because as a betting operator, you have to make sure that customers are in a specific region at a specific time and they're not using a proxy server. We had to do all of that. And then on top of that, we had to deal with blockchain. Can you imagine if you're a betting company, right? Let's just say, okay, if you don't understand esports, let's talk about football. Let's say you're watching a football game and you want to know if Tom, or you're placing bets on that game while Tom Brady's running with the ball. I'm going to bet 100 bucks that Tom Brady's going to fumble that ball. You can do live betting in games, but could you imagine doing that on blockchain? Like that would take 10 years, you know, not, not 10 years, 15 minutes. By the time that's over, you know, the game is over. You can't do that. So what we did was we created something called Unicorn, Unicorn Wallet, which is an internal blockchain that handles high-speed transactions, same thing as a regular blockchain does, but it also doesn't charge transaction fees. So people take their Unicorns from their public wallet, they put it on the Unicorn wallet, and they can transact on our platform. And then we started going after regulators. First thing we did was we went to Malta. Malta is amazing, by the way. I don't know if you guys heard, but Binance moved to Malta today. We were in Malta two, three years ago, and now Malta has approved us as the first uh, legal um, sports betting operation for crypto betting. They actually put us in their sandbox. So we're helping to sort of develop the sandbox and soon you'll be able to legally bet with Unicoin Gold in 80% of Europe. So what Unicorn does again is we create, you know, a, a viewing experience for esports where people can bet and watch. Um, we have things where customers can connect their gaming accounts to, to our platform. So it doesn't have to be about wagering. There's other uses for the token. If they connect their Riot, their Steam, or other accounts to the platform, they actually earn both silver and gold on the platform. The gold has to be turned over on the platform, but they earn it on the platform. Um, they can trade their skins. How many of you know what skins are? Well, let me tell you. Skins are virtual items that you can buy in video games. Let me repeat that. Skins are virtual items that make your character look different in a video game. Skins can range in price anywhere from, say, $10 to literally $60,000. Because if it's, a, if it's a limited skin, it'll go on a secondary market, and somebody somewhere is going to pay $60,000 for that skin. You can look it up. You can Google it and see this. So what did we do? 
we created a platform where a, a skin engine, where people can take their skins, come directly to Unicorn, and say, look, I want to just give you this skin. And instead of waiting for somebody to buy it, we'll buy it. We take a margin off the skin, then we take that skin and we put it into our jackpots, and then we let them participate in jackpots. The community loves it. Tons of turnover, lots of people are coming in and they're starting to trade in their skins, and this is all about building fans. It's all about building community, and it's all about building a real token economy. Like I said, we create content, we do things like ESPN would do video content, all kinds of written esports content. Um, we, we have this cool space inside of MGM where we're running uh, you know, weekly tournaments. There's a bunch of casinos now that want to work with us. Oh my God, the US is about to legalize sports betting. So the way it works here is you, know, you partner, it goes state by state, you've got to partner with casinos, and I think every single casino in the US is calling us because we're the best in esports. So they're calling us and want to find ways to, for us to partner with them. And I'm working with the regulators in the US trying to get them to understand crypto. Can you imagine being in a position where you got to deal with two different types of regulators? It's hard. But you know what the most important thing to remember is? Regulators are not here to make our life difficult. They're here to protect consumers. They're here to protect consumers from scams like BitConnect and USI Tech and 19, or sorry, let me just say 95% of the shit coins that are on the ICO list that are causing downward pressure on the crypto economy because that's exactly what's happening. There are some good tokens out there that are getting lost in the noise, but there are some really bad players out there who last year did exactly what I said at the beginning of the presentation, which is they created a token, they downloaded a picture of some guy, they photoshopped a website, and then they have you know, some joke where they steal tokens and, and coins from people all over the world. Um, and you know, to me, that's unacceptable. So. When we built our economy, we wanted to make sure that the Unicoin was the mortar to everything that we do. The Unicoin is at the center of Unicorn's ecosystem, both Unicoin Silver and Unicoin Gold. And it's all built on blockchain technology from the ground up, and it's basically natural for our users to use it. So I'm gonna quickly talk, okay, so I already talked to you about our investors. I'm gonna quickly talk to you about ICOs now. Just sort of refreshing, from based on my experience, how an ICO is done. Yesterday I met a guy who, uh, I don't know if he's here today, but I met him, he met him at a previous conference. And I said, hey, tomorrow I'm speaking about how to do an ICO. And he said, oh yeah, how to do an ICO today? Or how to do an ICO last year, right? Because today is different than it was last year. Last year anybody could run an ICO it seems, right? I mean, kids were in white papers and five pages, whatever, and raising 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars, ridiculous. So they're not as easy as they once were, and that's okay. But they're not impossible. The first thing you have to think about is what is your motivation for doing a token? If your number one motivation is to raise money, you're in it for the wrong reasons. You must stop and reconsider and go down the rest of this list because that is not how an ICO is going to work going forward in the future. Whether it's a security token, whether it's a utility token, whether it's a currency, it doesn't matter. It's not about, it shouldn't be about raising money. You must have a clear application for blockchain. Because if you don't have a clear application for blockchain, why are you here? Because you can't just say, I have a token, and I'm going to, you know, have a token economy and no blockchain. Like, you just can't do that. Your platform has to be, has to have a clear application for blockchain. And by the way, there's tons of great applications for blockchain. Anything that requires trust, transparency, anything, basically anything in commerce, healthcare, you know, banking, gambling, uh, there's lots of spaces, insurance, lots of spaces that could use blockchain technology. So you really gotta be creative about how you're gonna use blockchain. By the way, the blockchain community won't embrace you unless you understand this part. And if you don't have the blockchain community behind you, you might as well just pack it in because they're just going to bash you. Anyone heard of Bitcoin 2.0? Pretty sweet. It's got two eyes in it. It's got Steven Seagal as their spokesperson. Man, those guys, it's not funny because I'll tell you what, those guys, they're running ads on the radio talking about how this shit is Bitcoin 2.0 and it's going to replace Bitcoin. No wonder the SEC is going crazy. Like, no wonder the government is going nuts. When you got Steven Seagal saying, you know, I've got a token I created on the Ethereum platform and it's gonna replace Bitcoin and we're selling it for $5 each, doesn't that boil your blood thinking that your mom or your uncle or your cousin or somebody might end up buying that? 
So you have to have a clear application for blockchain. The third thing is, do you understand your customer? Because if you come to me and you say you're going to open up a retirement community on the blockchain, I'm going to politely tell you to fuck off. Because you cannot do that, right? You can clap for that. That's OK. So you have to understand your customer and your customer base and make sure that they understand. And by the way, they don't have to completely understand. If they don't, you have to make it easy for them. You have to make it super simple. You know, you have to take the Jack's wallet and make it even easier for them to get their tokens and to work on your platform. Uh, do you have a working product? Do you have an active community? Do you have a team that eats, leave, lives, breathes, and sleeps your platform? If you're just five people who want to ICO, this won't work. But if you're five people who have a passion about something that they're working on, that happens to have a blockchain you know, application, that happens to have a community of fans, that happens to have a culture, that becomes the soul of your brand. And the brand is a living, breathing entity for your token. Your token is the last thing that comes up, OK? So if you really think about this, a community is everything. And I'm not just talking about the Telegram community that you set up to, to sell your ICO, because that community is fickle. They will come, and they will go. And they don't give a shit about you or your customer. All they care about is the speculation of your token going up. I'm talking about your core community who loves your platform. You have to have that. Do you remember when Apple was going bankrupt and Steve Jobs came on stage, he re returned back to the company, and everybody thought Apple was going to die? And who was there in the audience watching him? Is every word, his fans, right? That's what it's all about. And very few companies understand that, how to build a fan base. You have to build that. You better have a damn good lawyer and accounting firm. Oh my God. So, you know, I love Perkins Coie. I dealt with Perkins Coie. It's important to understand the law. It's important to understand the Howey test. It's important to at least understand where the SEC is coming from. Right now, they haven't really come up with a formal position yet, but it's important to understand the difference between a true utility and a security. If you're promising returns on your token, uh, you're selling a security. I don't care. If you're giving interest, if you're giving dividends or any of that stuff, bonuses, you're probably breaking the law. <laughs> so you want to be careful. And as far as accounting, oh my god. Can you imagine the accounting that we have to go through? We are, we, not only did we have to do the accounting on the tokens that we collected during the token sale, right? the Ethereum that we collected, I should say, and the time that we collected it, and the mark-to-market -market accounting that we have to do. But then on top of that, every time somebody comes to our platform, trades in the skin for a UKG, and then the UKG goes out, we have to account for that. Every time they come back and they use the UKG in a raffle, we have to account for that. Every time they come back and they do a bet, we got to account for that. Every single thing we got to account for. Crypto accounting is hard. Find a good crypto accounting firm. We found one in San Francisco. I think it's very important, and I think um, you know, it just adds to the le legitimacy of your business. And there's so many problems to be solved in the blockchain space that don't require a token. What I mean by that is, there was a VC panel here earlier, and there were some people saying, yeah, I'd invest 80% tokens, 20% equity. No, I'd invest 100% equity. VC is getting disrupted no matter what. No matter what. Whether they like it or not, they're getting disrupted. Tokens are here. Now, Everything will be tokenized, I think. I think you'll see real estate get tokenized. I think you'll see lots of things get tokenized. But there's so many problems in the blockchain space that need to be solved in order to build this space out. If you want to see Bitcoin hit $25,000, number one thing we need is governments to support it. Governments need to regulate it in a way that is not uh, uh, anti-innovation. So they have to support innovation. Number two is it has to be easy to use for customers has to be easy for people to be able to transact with it. And number three is it, it has to, um, you have to have banks that support it. <laughs> because when you're running around with you know, a bunch of Ethereum and Bitcoin as a, as a CEO, that's hard enough. But imagine having to bank all of the stuff that you're holding in reserves. All of that stuff is difficult. So banks need to support it. So that's it. I am opening up for questions. I would like you to raise your hand for a microphone. Um, and by the way, if you want to contact me, the best way to contact me is on Twitter, at Rahul Su. OK, hands up. Microphone's here. There you go. <coughs> I, oh yeah. So if you can uh, tell us more about how did you solve the problem of 
uh, building a token, a cryptocurrency where you have wallets and all the complexity and making it like super easy for a person to acquire that token. And where do they acquire the token from? Sure. So the super easy to acquire the token, accessibility is very key for tokens, right? So the first and most obvious thing is you try and get you know, on exchanges or you try and work with exchanges, usually through people who backed your token or the community will go out. And you want to get like vast you know, um, exchange access. Now exchanges now are getting harder to list tokens because they won't list just any token anymore. You'll be on Ether Delta, no problem. They'll list anything. They'll list friggin' BitConnect. If BitConnect came back, you know, it'd be on Ether Delta. But that's not good. You need access. You need to get on places like Bittrex. You need to get on places like OKEX. You need to get on every single major exchange around the world for access. And then the second part is you also need it to be easy for the users to acquire the tokens on the platform. So, you know, I like things like Shapeshift. I think that's interesting. I think there's other applications that could come out where it makes it easy for users to be able to use the platform. How did we do it? We basically built a user-centric blockchain application where the blockchain's in the background. The users don't realize it's there until they see it. But it's not one of those weird things where you got to enter in addresses and all that stuff. The only thing they do is they have to enter in a private key for their unicorn wallet because the user is always the custodian of their own tokens. We can never be that custodian. So they have to use a private key. They have to understand what that means. Um, essentially, I w all I can say is just get a good user experience person and, and engineer it from user first back into blockchain. Next question. Yes. Thanks, Rahul. That was fascinating. My name's Claire. I'm from Isonomy. We have a um, digital AML compliance platform that allows blockchain companies to comply across multiple jurisdictions. And I was interested to hear about what you're saying about the regulators and our experiences that regulators are actually more amenable, constructive, and forward-thinking than banks. Um, I'm interested, do you have a banking relationship now, and how have you managed to actually convince them? Well, we do have a banking relationship because we came from a highly regulated industry that understands that you need AML and KYC. By the way, if you're doing a token sale and you're doing the old smart contract thing, where you have a smart contract on an Ethereum wallet and you're anonymously getting tokens, uh, A, I will hack your smart contract in two seconds. No problem. I can do that because there's lots of vulnerabilities in it. Number two, and the most important thing is, no bank will touch you. You will never be able to bank ever again. So if you want to deal with you know, Ethereum and tokens the rest of your life, go for it. But good luck in trying to find a legit bank who's going to work with you, especially one in the US. Or even, you know, you might go super far Eastern Europe and find some bank somewhere. But my, my recommendation is that you do deal with a platform like that where you do have full AML. So yes, for us, we do have a banking relationship. And we have multiple banking relationships and more coming. Yep. Next question. Next question. Down there, okay. Yes. Run, baby, run with that mic. There he goes. And he's off. There it is. Uh, hi, Raul. Uh, I only learned about Unicorn and Unicorn Gold today, so uh, correct me if I'm missing something, but as I understand, uh, most of Unicorn Gold's uh, functionality could be replaced by Ethereum. So why did you opt for, for Unicorn Gold? As awesome question. To using a awesome value? question. Great question. So Unicorn is our brand, right? It's, it's, it's not just a logo on a shirt. It's foundational to create a brand, I believe. You have to have community. You have to have a product that they love. And you have to have a culture that people live, eat, breathe, and sleep. And as a betting operator, I can't think of one betting operator in the world, whether it's Tabcorp, whether it's Bet365, whether it's anybody, where people would go around and wear their merchandise. Because nobody likes them, right? They're just a utility. And if you're from the UK or from Australia or wherever, you know what I'm talking about. Nobody likes those guys. But they'll bet with them because they like to bet. But they hate the company or they don't like the brand. So for us, it was about brand building and in a space where fans are everything, we wanted to create an identity within that space because esports is huge, hundreds of millions of fans out there, and Unicorn is becoming synonymous with esports. So we thought, you know, we need to create a branded experience, and the token is the center of our entire ecosystem. That's why we did that. 
Um, otherwise, you're absolutely right. We could have used any token. We could use any crypto. But that's not about, that's more of a transactional relationship versus building a group of evangelists who are your fans and customers. Next question. Right here. Uh, do microphone, please. Raise your hand high. Thank you. Perfect. It's coming up. We need people on the other side to hear. Okay. So, uh, what if uh, instead of going ICO, if we, uh, the product itself has intrinsic value and the token is a utility token, do we have to go ICO? Can we just skip the ICO, just launch directly onto public exchanges? No. I mean, sure, I guess, if a public exchange will list you. Um, I mean, you want users to have your token, right? So I'm assuming yes. you have users who are buying the token. Uh, and if that's the case and you have a user economy, then yeah, you don't have to ICO. The, you know, the, the reason that people ICO is to get exposure for their token to the, to the greater market. Um, but if you're fortunate enough, which very few people are, if you're fortunate enough to have customers who are buying your token, you could easily just go to an exchange and, and list it, assuming the exchange agrees with you that it's a utility and not a security. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, I do believe in security tokens. I do believe that it makes sense. I believe that companies will start to tokenize. I think that real estate will tokenize. I think a lot of things will tokenize, but it requires cooperation from government and also exchanges to become security approved exchanges. So I think that is the future. Um, I don't think there is, it means that, I don't think it means that utility tokens disappear. I think there, there is a sp uh, space and there will continue to be a space for utility tokens. Question behind you. Green shirt. Hey, I would like to know a little bit more about the different dynamics for the gold and silver coins. Sure. Um, well, they're basically the same coin. Um, the big difference is you can't bet with gold in markets where we're not licensed or uh, registered to operate gold betting. Um, we consider gold like, a, like any sort of thing of value. So with that being said, it's, it's amazing, but like, our number four market is Korea, uh, and it's almost number three. And what's crazy about that is we're not localized for Korea. Our platform is purely in English. So we have a platform that runs in Korea, and people are using it, using silver all day long, but they're earning gold, and they're using gold in other ways. And how do I communicate with them? Well, we go to Kakotak, which most Koreans use, and I go on there, and they communicate with emojis and Korean. I only understand the emojis. I'm not kidding you. You go on there, and you'll see, like, dancing bears if they're happy, or man slamming B in ground if he's mad. So I will go on Kako Talk, and I'll submit some news. I'm saying, hey, everybody. I do it in English. Hey, everybody, check out what Unicorn's doing today. And I wait, like, five seconds, and then, boom, all the emojis come up, and I can tell if they're happy or, or mad. But we need to localize, and we will localize. But that's where we use silver. We use silver in Asia. We use silver in lots of places. OK, next question. Anything else? Are we good? I think we're going to end right now. All right. Let's give Raul a Thank you. Getting the hook. All right, thanks.